So the sun's finally out and that means put the camera down and get to work. Lately we've been trying to get as much firewood put up as we can for next season. Um, so I figured in this video I'd go over some of the tools that we use, uh, how we select trees to cut, how we cut them, how we stack, pretty much how we do firewood as a sustainable way to heat our house. So there's a wood lot down the road uh, of about 10 acres and we've gone down there and marked a few trees that are standing dead or that, are, that just need to come out. And uh, that's what we're going to do today. We're going to try and take those three trees or what's left of trees and cut it up into firewood and get it out of there, get it over here and get it stacked. But before we do that, I wanted to talk about some of the tools and safety equipment we use when we are cutting up firewood. So I have my little wagon. Uh, this is where I have all my tools, easy to get into the woods and uh, you know stack wood in and get it out. And a lot of times we'll be down in a kind of a remote, hard to get to area and we'll haul the wood out up to the truck and then truck it back here. <laughs> Safety equipment, helmet, which has your hearing, hearing protection and a face guard. I typically only use this if I'm felling trees. Um, otherwise I use earplugs like this. These are safety chaps. I have to admit I don't wear them as often as I should because they are really hot, but they do work 100%. If you don't believe me, I'll link to a video that Taras Call did, otherwise known as Crazy Russian Hacker, where he laid them down and cut them with a chainsaw. They choked the saw to a dead stop before getting through all of the safety material inside. They do work, and I do recommend you use these, especially if you're in a weird terrain area where you have a chance of kind of moving or falling. Also they have good pockets in them so you can keep your your chainsaw wrench and I keep my fell felling wedges in here. So these help you keep a cut open or when you're felling a tree kind of hammer it in and help it fall. This is the pole saw I use. You probably saw me use it in the Widowmaker video. I use this to get rid of limbs, clear an area of limbs before starting to buck up a tree. If you're in a situation where the tree has fallen, and usually has fallen on a bunch of saplings and compressed them and they're really springy and you want to be careful that you get rid of all that springy stuff because if you make a cut and one lets loose it can whip up and take your head off. Shut up bird. <laughs> Now after I did the uh, Widowmaker video and I used this pole saw, I was so impressed with it I went and got the uh, electric version of the chainsaw. Both of these use the same battery, they're 40 volt, 2.5 milliamp hour batteries that lets you run them for about 90 minutes which is just about enough time to get tired and need to take a break. And what I like about them is they only take about 45 minutes to recharge the batteries. So these work great for small bucking and limbing. Uh, I've actually cut down a black locust with this. It, was, it took it a while to get through it, but it actually it cut it down. I mean, it was about, you know, that big around. I wouldn't recommend doing that all the time with this, but this is great for cutting small limbs. And it's super light. And if you just have to do small maintenance type stuff, you don't have to dig out your big heavy gas saw and carry the gas and the oil and all that stuff with you. So it's a good light duty tool. So these come with, a, when you buy these, if you buy the pole saw or the uh, electric chainsaw, it comes with a charger and a battery. And the battery is a lithium ion deal. It's got a button on it that will tell you the level of charge, which is handy. Which, that one's half charged. And then I got my spares. So we're ready to go. These are all charged up. And again, I mentioned uh, ear plugs if I'm not using the uh, helmet. I use these for shooting and anytime I'm running power equipment. I bought a case of these like five years ago and I'm, it'll probably last me forever. They're really good, really comfortable, hang around your neck. Uh, gloves, you know, if you've watched any of our videos, you know we always use these kind of gloves. These are just little sweater type gloves with uh, nylon or whatever it is. It's really grippy. These are like 12 bucks a dozen and they're awesome. I love them. The only other thing is to make sure you're, you have a partner with you if you're cutting in the woods. I won't recommend cutting in the woods alone. All kinds of bad things could happen. Have a partner. 
This is a little woodsman hatchet that I use as a Gransford's Bruck, which is perfect for just kind of cleaning up limbs and anything you need to use to cut small stuff with it. This is the saw I use. This is a steel MS-271 power head with a 24 inch bar. This is the bar and the chain that came with it. You can put different length of bars with different length chains. Uh, as long as your saw power head, it's called a power head, it's just the engine, as long as that can handle the length of the, the bar, you can increase or decrease the bar based on the diameter tree you want to cut. This is a pretty light to medium duty saw. I mean, after using it for a while, it'll make your arm tired, but they make super big, awesome forestry level saws. Steel, Husqvarna, and uh, I think Johnson's the other one. Those are the top three saws on the market. This is the best saw I've ever owned. Basic features of it are uh, just like any other good chainsaw, it's got a, a brake that, that uh, locks the chain. Put gas in here. This is a 50-50 gas oil two-cycle mix. I also use fuel stabilizer in it. If you use pump gas, any kind of gas that has ethanol in it, always use stabilizer in any small engine on your farm, otherwise you'll end up with lots of problems. The other alternative, if you don't want to use fuel stabilizer, is use ethanol-free gas. Usually you can get those at, you can get that at some gas stations. You can almost always get it at a boat marina because boat gas can't have ethanol in it. Um, but otherwise use fuel stabilizer like stable. This is where you put your bar oil. Keep this full, keeps your uh, chain oiled as it spins. This is the saw tool wrench, comes with your saw, and I think they're pretty universal across most brands uh, as far as the size. But you use that to tighten and loosen your, your chain by loosening these two bolts. You can take this whole cover off to remove the bar and the chain, but typically what you're doing is uh, loosening that. See how loose this chain is? I always loosen this chain when I'm done using it because as it cools, the metal shrinks and it'll tighten up. And then when I get ready to use it, I'll tighten it up a little bit because then as it runs, it'll loosen up. And you want to just kind of keep an eye on it as you're using it. You don't want it to be too loose. Like you don't want these teeth to come out of there like that. That's too loose to actually run. So you just loosen this up a little bit. And then you take the other end, which is a flathead screwdriver, put it in here, and you tighten up the bar to where it, it pulls, but it's not coming out of the bar. And then you can test it by taking your brake off, make sure everything works, and that it's moving smoothly. And if you're all right with that, then you can tighten this back up. to go okay so we'll talk about chains real quick two kinds of chains there's a crosscut chain which you use when you're bucking a log or cutting a tree down and there's a rip chain which you use to make a cut the lengthwise of the timber usually you use a rip chain if you're going to use like a chainsaw mill to cut slabs or uh, lumber I don't have a rip chain yet because I also don't have a, a chainsaw mill yet but that I'm gonna get one so a crosscut chain is what you're going to typically find on a saw. So a crosscut chain has sets of alternating teeth. So this one goes this way, this one goes that way. And as the saw moves, each one of these teeth is removing material as it, as it spins. This part here is called the rake or the depth gauge. And this is what controls how deep this tooth cuts. When you're sharpening your saw, you always want to make sure that these are at the correct distance apart from the top of this to the top of this uh, tooth. If this depth gauge is filed down too far, then the tooth is going to try to remove more material than it should. And that can overheat your chain and make it weak, and it could potentially break it, and you don't want that. If this uh, depth gauge is too tall, then this tooth is not going to remove as much material as it should, making it a lot more 
a lot less efficient and basically wasting gas. So you always want to make sure your depth gauge is the right height for this tooth and the way you know that is you look on the um, you basically you look on the paperwork that the chain comes with it'll tell you most chains are have a 30 degree uh, angle on the on the tooth and the depth of the rake is determined by the manufacturer of the chain before you start make sure your chain is sharp um, if you hit dirt or a rock with your chain, stop and resharpen your blade because you're going to end up just throwing dust, overheating your chain, weakening the chain, uh, and just basically wasting your time and doing a lot of work you don't need to do. So if your chain is sharp, you're throwing chips and not dust. So there's a lot of ways to sharpen a chain. There's all kinds of gadgets on the market. The most basic one is just a round file that is the right diameter for your chain teeth. Uh, they also make guides that allow you to keep it level and lined up at the right angle. Uh, really good experienced loggers and foresters can just sit there and whip through it. But for people who only occasionally use them, having one of those aftermarket tools is probably a little bit, a little better. I don't use this anymore unless it's an, a, an emergency or a backup because steel came out with this, which is a saw sharpener made just for their saws. This has a round file for the tooth, a flat file for the depth gauge. Everything is set up just for these chains. And you just basically line this edge up parallel to your uh, bar and run it through the same number of times on each tooth. And it files everything at the right, uh, with the right measurements all at once. It makes this super easy and takes all of the guesswork out. So I find the colored link. I put it at the end of the bar, lock the chain, and that's where I know my starting point is. If you don't have a colored link, you can use just a Sharpie and color the tooth. But you, the point is to mark your starting point and then work your way along the chain, skipping every other tooth. Uh, and then you just you know kind of line this up parallel with the bar and push it through the same number of times on each tooth. You know, and then you run through the entire length like I said and then basically you switch sides to do the other tooth talk a little bit about the, the wood pile and how I have this set up. A full cord of wood is four feet tall, four feet deep, eight feet wide. Uh, and that's 128 cubic feet of wood. The way I have this set up is I've used uh, two nine foot pallets together. So that gives me 18 feet. I cut my wood 15 inches long, to, which is the perfect size to fit in our wood stove. And I stack them three deep, which is 45 inches. Uh, and that gives me an inch or two in between each row to make four feet deep, three rows. And then I'll stack these four feet tall. And then I have 18 feet of length, which gives me 2.8-ish cords per stack. And I have four stacks, 11.2, that's 11.2, I think, cords. And then up in the woodshed, we can fit another cord. So basically 12 cords I can handle uh, the way I have set up right now to, uh, to get everything stacked and seasoned, which is plenty for at least one and probably two and a half seasons of our burning, heating season. Now a lot of this is uh, white oak that we just cut that, has, that was dead and had been laying for at least a year. Uh, we just cut and split this so it's pretty dry uh, the way you generally test if it's ready to burn is you want a moisture content of 20 percent or less less than 20 percent one of the resources i've used when i've been kind of reading up on firewood is uh, eric over at life and farmland he makes a ton of great firewood videos uh, things about how to use a, and operate a wood stove he makes just all kinds of wood heating type of videos and he uses a moisture meter 
and I actually picked one up after watching one of his videos. This tells you exactly the moisture content of the wood and uh, it's battery operated and you just jam it into your wood. That's 19.7 so even though we just cut and split that it was dead for a long time in the woods you could take this right off and burn it. Fourteen. So this is a good way to quickly check the moisture content of your wood, see if it's ready to burn or not. Another way is the old-fashioned knocking a couple pieces together. If you get that sound, that usually means it's about ready to burn. If it's a real thick, wet sound, then uh, it still needs some seasoning. So all right, so the way I have this set up is I just put the pallets down on uh, stones and over there they're on some bricks basically just get them up off the ground so air can get under I don't cover my wood uh, I try and let it sit for at least four to six months during the summer when it's getting the most heat and the most wind on it to dry it out quickly and then as it approaches burning season maybe October beginning of November I will cover it so rain or snow doesn't kind of ruin it the other thing I'm going to do is run a rope from each to the top of each of these posts to kind of hold them together. As we stack this up, I don't want the posts to go this way, so uh, I'm going to put a rope up there to keep everything tight. But our goal is within the next couple days to finish filling this. There's a rack over there that needs filled, and there's a completely empty rack over there that needs filled all the way, so we got to get to work. Got your bar oil. Got my gas and oil mix, two cycle gas mix. And that's it, we're ready to go. So we're gonna shoot over to the, the wood lot and start cutting. And don't forget some lollipops. This tree here is one we've tagged to take down. Uh, the top is completely gone. The bottom is probably still alive, but it does need to come down. And there's uh, two other ones in here that we put ribbon on. One is over there, I think it's a black locust. And then there's one right here. This one's leaning pretty good. This is uh, an old white oak. It's dead pretty much all the way to the top. It's nothing but a squirrel house now, so we're gonna take this one as well. It's hollow inside. This wood lot is pretty diverse with a bunch of different species of hardwoods and softwoods and pretty much everything. We'll go through and we'll tag dead stuff like this. Obviously with this you just limb and get rid of. Some of it you can burn but that's dead. That one there, uh, I think it's a white oak, but when it's got like three branches coming out of the bottom of it, we usually try and take one if it's dead uh, to help the rest of it grow helps open up the canopy um, and, and promote some of these smaller allow some of these smaller trees to grow up uh, but usually when we're choosing a tree it's dead standing or has recently fallen uh, and the ones we really want are things like black locust white oak uh, elm trees that grow around here that are hardwoods that burn really well we do burn pine as well. We have a lot of it on our lot. Uh, it's not the ideal wood for firewood, but uh, it burns fast. It doesn't burn as hot as hardwood, but it burns really dirty and produces a lot of smoke and creosote. Uh, so you, if you do burn pine, just make sure you keep your chimneys cleaned, your stovepipe cleaned out. It's the last thing you want is a chimney fire. small tree. 
tree, so I'm gonna get rid of that small tree first. Remember. I'm gonna take this collie bush out of here too. This didn't fall exactly where I wanted it, but it's kind of in the, in the spot. So being the physics nerd that I am, I'm trying to look and see where all the limbs are, what they're pushing against, figure out what's in compression and what's in tension. So it has fallen on this rhododendron. It's bent this sapling over, which is very springy. We don't want that releasing and hitting us. <clears throat> and then we'll go up the tree and look for uh, saplings that it has fallen on and we want to get all that out of the way so that this kind of is just laying on its own and not holding any springy things that could zap us. So I'm going to take this out with the pole saw. This is the exact reason I got the pole saw so we can cut stuff and be far away from it in case it springs. That's why we have a pole saw. Needs a karate kick. Huh? Needs a karate kick. Yeah. Alright, well we got it down. It was hung up in some springy stuff. So it took a couple cuts to get it to fall and settle. And uh, now I've got these branches that are thick enough to be firewood so we're just going to buck them up real quick with this little electric saw which is perfect for this now like I said before my I try to cut my firewood in 15 inch lengths so that puts the 15 right at the L so I just put the L right there and do one of them deals. This tree has turned out to be a little more technical than usual with all this branch activity. So I got one more main branch right here. It's leaning up against that tree and the whole log is tr trying to go that way. <clears throat> Which means that the top of this branch is uh, in compression and the bottom would be in tension, meaning it wants to do this. And so, I'm going to make an undercut on that branch with this pole saw so I can stay away from it. And see if I can get this to let loose. I've got this sapling here to kind of protect me in case anything goes weird. If I get that disconnected, then uh, this log will sit. We can finish butt bucking it up. There she is. 
she goes. Oh look, it's Laura Croft. All you guys who cut firewood and use chainsaws all the time already know this, but just for the purpose of demonstrating for new people who are maybe just getting into it, um, this particular branch is dead off this oak tree and it could snap off kind of at any time and drop over that trail. So what I figured I'd do is demonstrate how to make a felling cut <clears throat> and sort of steer it where you want. So typically you're going to since this is leaning this way, we'd like it to fall that way also. Cut a, uh, a wedge out, sort of at the angle you want it to fall. And then you back cut about a half to an inch above that wedge, just enough to get it to start to fall. And it acts as a hinge and it will fall using that as a control joint. So I'm gonna demonstrate how that works. Looks pretty good. Then cut the top part. Okay, now we have our wedge. Now I'm going to cut the uh, the back cut about an inch above that wedge until it starts to fall, and then we'll just let it fall. A little windy so we want to calm down a little bit. Alright, the wind is kind of chilled out so we're going to keep going. There she goes. Now you notice that I didn't cut the whole way through. I only cut just until it started to fall until I started to see it move. You want as much material remaining as possible to control that fall on that hinge. <clears throat> and then once it hits, then it'll usually snap off. That's kind of the basics. Believe it or not, I bucked the entire top of this tree with just this little electric saw. It worked pretty good. It's nice and light so you don't get tired. And now we're into the part where it's about 10 inches across and I'm going to switch to the gas saw and just finish bucking this up and loading it up. And then we'll uh, probably be done for today.
Meeper vision. So maybe trying to do all three trees today was a little over ambitious, but we did get the white oak done and we'll get her unloaded and split. Um, we are not professional loggers or foresters or firewood people, obviously, so don't look to us for this as an official training. This is just a how we do stuff. So if you're new to chainsaws and cutting wood and things like that, just an overview of how we do it. And uh, that's all for now. We're gonna continue chipping away at this for the next couple days and we will see you in the next video. Thanks for watching. Right, this I have kind of most of my tools stacked up in here ready to go. Get. Uh, Get. <laughs> So I have uh, all my tools kind of in this little wagon, which we use to haul wood out. I'm going to shoot you. I'm not a professional logger or forester or firewood cutter. Yeah.